problem I seem to understand from this topic is to do with terminology. However, one of the maxims of Islamic jurisprudence is that they, uh, they say, uh, La ibra fi, uh, sorry, al ibra fil hukud, uh, that what is what matters when it comes to transactions and agreements, lil maqasid wal maani, la lil alfaz wal mabani. The concern of Islamic jurisprudence is not on the words you use to describe things, but what's the intent, uh, what's the meaning. And so when we look at using the word rape to describe what goes on in the family in the form of uh, sexual assault, um, I think if we look at uh, murder within the family, we don't change the name because it is done in the family. We don't change the name of theft or stealing just because the son stole. We don't say it's not stealing because it's your father and you have some right uh, indirectly to property or injury, etc. So I think one of the challenges, again, in this area is the assumption that because you call it rape, it automatically takes one punishment for everybody and denies the judge the right to decide what is the most appropriate punishment for every form of rape, some being much more severe than the other, which would be life imprisonment, which would be some other punishment, which would be death sentence, etc. I think it is clear among Muslim scholars that Islam and the Prophet ﷺ taught la darar wa la dirar. You don't harm, nor do you reciprocate harm. So many verses of the Quran and Hadith make scholars conclude that um, al-asl fil madar al-tahrim, that the premise, the operating default position on Islam on any form of hurt, any form of harm, is haram. And that in marriage, anything that humiliates the wife, anything that tramples upon her rights and dignity, you commit any form of domestic abuse or violence, you even insult her parents, it's a basis for which she can get a divorce and actually take you to court for defamation or abuse. So, and that is worse than, you, can, you are not even allowed to dispose of her property. How much more trample on her dignity? One problem I see within the general population and I've attended interfaith uh, programs on the subject of metaphor is uh, sorry on uh, marital rape is the kind of metaphors we have for marriage. Unfortunately, some men and cultures view marriage as if it's a sale purchase agreement, as if you are because you paid something that they call a bride price that it is equivalent to ownership or you have bought sexual rights that you can exploit at will. What I see in the Quran and the Sunnah is really more a metaphor for partnership. That the mahar is a gift. It's a token of appreciation. That is why it could be things other than finance. That's why it could be uh, an iron ring. It is not the value of the woman, nor is it a purchase of sexual rights. Uh, both husband and wife have equal sexual rights to each other. What we find in the Quran and the Sunnah is that the Quran describes men and women as azwaj, which means pairs, partners, couples. It describes antum libasul lahunna wa hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahunna. That they are garments, like clothing, to cover your dignity. They are garments for you just as you are garments for them. Allah describes the best of you are those who are best to their wives. It describes men and women as awliya, com, com, you know, protecting friends of one another. And so when we look at the issue even in marriage of sexual rights, because it is a right of the wife to have sexual access to husband under justified circumstances, and it is a right of the husband to have sexual access to his wife under fair uh, circumstances, it is a sin on the husband or the wife to unjustifiably deny the other what is their due right that emanates from the, con the, the, the marital contract. And so I would say here that a right to use a relationship for pleasure is a mutual right, not a right to abuse. The permission for sex is not a permission to humiliate or to coerce and oppress. The right to touch the other and benefit is not a right to beat. The right to make love, strengthen the relationship, have children, is not a right to sexual violence, sexual abuse, or rape, even in the name of marriage. And so one of the 
big challenges, I would say, on the question of marital rape we have in our society is forced marriage, where cultural pressure, family pressure, force a woman to marry. And I should say some men are forced to marry women they really don't want from family pressure. However, what we have seen from doctors reporting the problems of marital rape is a woman who was forced to marry somebody, and then the man wants to dominate and teach his wife a lesson, and he rapes her, sexually assaults her, and she can't go to court and say, my husband sexually assaulted me. Of course, from marital counselors, we've also seen a lot of problems coming in this area from pornography and the influence it is having. Alcohol is a big area on this. And the last thing I'd like to touch on is a comment on the question that was raised earlier on the age of marriage or betrothal. Most cultures, most customs throughout history until modern age never fixed a prescribed age for marriage. It has been left open to family. It is the family that would decide what age you would own a weapon, climb a horse, ride an animal, buy, own, uh, manage your inheritance, a whole political office, etc. It was not the society that dictated m many of these things. It was the family that would say, yes, you can ride, you can this. What we find in Islamic history is mainly what is called descriptive. If somebody says the Prophet Muhammad married Aisha at an early age, uh, and some say six, and I should mention here, Muslim scholars have differed on the question of the age of the marriage of Aisha. In spite of the statement in Buhari and Muslim, some say it is six, some say nine, some say 11, some say 13, some say 16. It's an area on which scholars differ. But whatever age somebody concludes on, it is describing. The Prophet married Hadija, some say at 29, according to Ibn Mas'ud, some say 40. This is describing. It is not prescribing it as this is, or this is what it should be or this is what it must be. And so what we find in Islamic jurisprudence is what is called maslaha or sadu zariya. Maslaha means concern for public interest. Sadu zariya means laws that come in to make prohibited things that were earlier permissible. It is called blocking the means of preclusion in the interest of the public or the individual. And so what we have is things like traffic laws that prohibit you the freedom to travel in the interest of the public. You must respect the traffic laws. Environmental laws. We have limited age for driving, riding a motorcycle or driving a car or a plane for retirement, for this job and that job, for this type of study or that type of study of criminal responsibility, political office, etc. And so if a society feels that it is in the best interest of its own community, the health of the children, the health of the children to be born out of a particular marriage, from a utilitarian cost-benefit analysis and what is actually in the best interest of the child in the modern context, the community and its leadership has a right with the full support of scholars to fix a minimum age for marriage just as Islam allows for fixing minimum age for anything in the interest of the public. And Allah knows best. Assalamu alaikum. Um, just a follow up question before we move on. Yes. Um, yes, just a small follow up question before we move on. Um, considering that there are several issues that can arise from the practice in several communities where young women who would legally be considered children are uh, married off at early ages. Um, would you not say that it is uh, probably time that the Muslim community in Nigeria um, institute a minimum age for marriage, especially considering that um, many Muslim nations across the world have already done so? Absolutely. I mean, we were among the last countries to eradicate polio. We're backwards in nearly everything, and even in the area of legal reforms. And this is something that Malaysia, many other Muslim countries and scholars have done. But I think on our side, a couple of things. The government recognizes that religious scholars have a voice in the community and they matter. However, we have not found the concerted effort to ensure that our best and brightest study religion or that we build the capacity of our scholars. 
And so a lot of legal reforms that are established and suggested and proposed by Muslim scholars are actually countered by many Muslim scholars that are not nearly as qualified, but because they take there are a lot of people who listen to them. So I entirely agree with you. However, as they say, to travel far, you go with others. To travel fast, you go alone. I think a lot of our traditional scholars have unfortunately not understood how new fatwas, they agree in principle that la yunkar hukum bi tagir zaman, that there's an agreement among scholars that there is no denying that there will be change in rulings or change in fatwa with the change in context, change in time, change in culture. However, the mechanism of that change is an area that I think we have not um, learned how to use properly. In Islamic finance, the scholars there, actually all the graduates of Usul al-Fiqh, Awaid, Maqasid, Sharia, seem to be congregating in Islamic finance. That's also where the money is for many of these scholars. So those who are actually good at ijtihad, juristic reasoning, um, seem to be moving in one field. And in the area of social justice, social laws, women's rights, interfaith relations, uh, I think we are unfortunately backwards. We definitely need to take this dialogue much further. Right. Thank um, you very much. Hi, yes, Haja Saudatri, do you want to yes, come please. in? Yes, right. please. Uh, Sheikh Bun, uh, may Allah bless you for being courageous to take the subject matter of marital rape. Uh, we are concerned as activists, and your explanations have really put it in perspective. One thing I want to bring to the table is this issue of the misrepresentation or perception of religious texts. For example, the ordinary uh, less educated person in a village would speak to you and say that the wife is his farm. He can approach her in any way and she has no right. If she denies him her attention or her body, she is cursed until the morning by all the angels of goodness. Now, we need to do more education that deconstructs the skewed understanding or knowledge that people have or understanding that they have of what you have explained, that the man that mutual responsibility to enjoy and to offer to each other the sakina you always speak to. Now, my question is, are there sharia remedies for a woman who gets to be assaulted either as a result, of course, when we say forced marriage, we know that dharma it is forced, so it, it's marriage, but there is assault. In a normal situation, can a wife seek redress for marital rape or, or, or you know, take away the nomenclature, sexual assault by her husband? Thank you. Where are you? Okay, salamu alaikum. Um, number one, I think, is simple answer. Yes, you've asked a number of questions, but let me start with the last one. Uh, can she seek redress by a court if she has a judge that is well-educated and she presents it that she was abused? The judge, even as we said earlier, if she can prove that her husband even slapped her and she wants to get out of that relationship, she can. In Maliki jurisprudence, if she just wants to get out of the family for no reason other than she has had enough. She can under what is called kulu. And we find this at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where a woman said, you know, her husband has not been unfair to her, unjust, she just lost love. And the Prophet said, are you ready to give him back uh, the garden he gave? So in Maliki law, with absolutely no reason, just as the husband can come in the relationship, and go out, the wife can come in and go out. However, we should remember how undesirable divorce is. You must, you should have a good reason. And if you find it is denigrating, trampling on your dignity, that is more than enough. So the judge can definitely give a divorce. And if there is injury, the judge can look at how to redress that. However, when you say law of the land, if something is a moral offense, like riba, it doesn't automatically mean it is a legal offense until it is put as a legal wrong. So if you approach 
and this is why sometimes some feel no need to have a separate law for marital rape if you can prove you were abused. We have enough under the various forms of abuse to handle that. On the side of religious scholars who would like to bring uh, uh, the Quranic verse and then the Hadith uh, on angels cursing, uh, when it says, even if you take it uh, from the literal point of view that um, your wives are here through Lakum, they are like your farmlands. Mm. Who destroys his farmland? Nobody. You, you handle your farmland in such a way that it will sustain you and your family. The whole field of agriculture which I studied is actually to ensure that you manage land with respect. You manage land, you tender to the land as something that you will benefit from. And so it's good in and good comes out of it. The other thing is to try and use that metaphor to then say you dis discard the other metaphors used in the Quran where it says, that they are like garments for you. All the word, use of the word, awliya, you are protecting friends of each other. We look at the sunnah of the Prophet. The Prophet ﷺ, when he said, the best among you, hayrukum, hayrukum li the best of you are those who are best to their wives. We can't go and try and misinterpret a metaphor to go out of sync with everything we see. When we look, listen to the Quran very explicitly, it mentions the maqasid of marriage, the objectives of marriage. And it mentions mawadda wa rahma, love and rahma, compassion. It mentions sakina, litaskunu ilayha, uh, tranquility. All the other verses that are explicitly clear go against any interpretation of the relationship to be one of exploitation that gives men the, you know, do what you want. The last point you raise on somebody saying um, that uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever, when a woman denies her husband sexual access, uh, angels curse her until morning, or there's a sin upon her. Because when you say you agree to marry, it means you agree that the other person can have sexual pleasure. And so when the Prophet said, there is no contract, no relationship contract more sacred than that of the marriage contract. And because the marriage gives the man and the woman equal access, if, if she commits a sin by denying her husband, he also commits a sin by denying the wife. We don't have in Islam a same wrong deed like stealing and you say the punishment is going to depend on the gender or ad, uh, idol worship, or adultery, or any crime. Um, Noor, I think you're, you're muted. I think you're muted, Noor. I think he's gone offline. Sorry. Okay. All right, then we're going to have to move on. Um, next, we have the Reverend Professor Cornelius. Are you online with us, Father? Sure. <laughs> yes. Um, you, you have a submission regarding the marriageable age of women from the Christian perspective. Yeah. Yes. So, Thank you very much, and um, sorry, because I'm on the road, the network has been off and on. I listen to a lot of the conversations, and um, especially that of uh, Archbishop Joe Boche, he gave a lot of um, biblical passages concerning uh, marriage and rape and the rest of them. But I want to say here that um, in the biblical text, we really don't have the specific age for marriage, but we can rely on the Jewish custom. The Jews, for them traditionally, the minimum age a woman can marry is 12. Whereas the age... Are you hearing me? Yes, sir, we're hearing you. Okay. Whereas the age of marriage for the man is between 18 and 24. But you will ask me, for example, like when Joash took over the throne of Israel at the age of seven, what happened? And of course, you know that at 
not a there's going to be a regent, but later on he had wives and so on and so forth. So the Old Testament, you know, ideally, what it what is stipulated that they talk about the age of puberty, which is a normal age that a woman should marry. But the New Testament had it, another view of it. If you read First Corinthians chapter seven. Where Jesus Christ was talking about, I mean, sorry, he said Paul was talking about uh, the marriage man and the married husband. And he said, it is expedient. This is what Paul said in First Corinthians chapter 7. It is even expedient for you not to marry at all. Especially if you want to choose a celibate life. But, be, but when you know that you have an irresistible urge that could push you into adultery or into rape, it is better for you to marry than to be on heat, on impartial. Here we can bring this some psychological interpretation. In psychology, for example, take the case of empirical psychology that believes that every normal human person has two natures. That is, human beings generally have two natures. There are people with touchy nature and there are people with flexible nature. Those with touchy nature, these are people with self-control. That even when they see a naked woman, they will not be aroused. It's, they can only be aroused when they make up their mind that look, we want to go for an action. Whereas those with flexible nature, these are people that cannot control themselves. Once they see a woman on skirt, they are off the gear. So that is that for that. But be it as, as it may, we should know that marriage is sacred. Marriage is a covenant. And it's a mutual agreement between a husband and a wife. So, when you see people who are causing rape and others, then what do you do? Is it because they are not married? Is it because of the age of marriage? I wouldn't say so. Because there are even married men and married women who still go ahead and commit adultery. But we want to say here that in the case of, you know, sexual deviation, you know that God is not happy with that kind of thing. Take the case of Sodom and Gomorrah. The sin by which that provoked God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah was the sin of Sodom. Human beings having an affair with fellow human beings and their animals. So then, uh, in the course of the conversation of uh, Archbishop uh, Joe Boche, he talks about the mercy of God. Uh, you know, take the case of the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. And Jesus Christ said, if there's anyone here who has no sin, let him be the one to first to cast a stone. No one did, because all of them know that they have all sinned and fallen short of the kingdom of God. So my question, actually, my contribution is to talk about the age of marriage for Christianity. But that would have been just a kind of yes and no answer. Only just to say that right now, we have a law, which is kind of law. The canonical age for a girl to marry is 18. The canonical age, that is Catholic Church now, is 18. Whereas for the man, the canonical age is as from 24. And the reason for this is considering maturity. And again, when the man is able to take care of the wife. So I think I would not really like to go on and on, but just to summarize it this way. Thank you very much. So I'm okay. I'm true. Hello, are you there? Bye, no. Bye. Yes, Reverend, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, well, did you hear everything I said? Yes, we did. Thank you very much. Okay, I thank you. Do you have that point so that you can stimulate for that conversation? All right, we're just going to move on to the next speaker. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have Pastor Taiwo Awosika, the General Seer of the Army of David. Hello, sir. Are you online? Hello? Uh, Hello, Pastor Taiwo, are you online? 
Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, you have you, a topic considering the enforcement and communal condemnation as a way out of rape and marital violence. Uh, exactly. Please be Well, good morning, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am quite glad to be with every one of us, and I've been so impressed by what I've been hearing from great men of God, especially the Islamic scholars that we've had and the honorable minister that joined us. I quickly want to correct uh, my name. My name is Modupe, Taiwo Modupe Awishika. I'm a Modu. Thank you. Thank you. I will Modu. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. I, I, yeah. I, I, I want to just say on the lighter mode that um, there were some mentalities that we grew up with many years ago. You know, when you're talking about it, let me say this ordinary woman. You know, you hear it from some of our people, the ordinary woman. And uh, that time, some say we want to join them together. We say um, husband is the head of the house, and some mm -hmm. take it to the level of uh, uh, what I call uh, 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 military, maybe marshal, and the general of like a principality speaking. I also look at um, also thinking of the angle of, um, of bright price. A lot of times when we pay so much, we feel that we have just bought the woman. And so having paid about <laughs> 2 million or 1.5 million of bright price, then you come up and say you, it's like you're buying a property. And um, I also, you know, thought of uh, um, at times uh, when you talk, when you, when you talk, you say, the, the the department of the woman is in the kitchen. And so these are things that we grew up with and that I believe have become a major problem, you know, for us, you know, in this society. I also want to talk about how we got into all this. We got into it through pornography. We got into it through failed marriages. We got into it through drugs. It is, uh, it is a known fact that about 14.3 million of Nigerians, uh, youth are on drugs right now. And we got into it through uh, a, a magazine cover. Many years ago, you know, when you talk about uh, our magazines, you you see women uh, at times doing their nude, and um, they became sex symbols. And this grew up, you know, to a level where, where uh, um, they, it, it comes to devaluation of the womanhood. The valuation of the womanhood. We got ourselves into all this, and also, you know, with uh, I, I, I remember many years ago, I can't touch. I, I don't know what it's called, Playboy magazine. But today, we have telephones that children carry around with uh, accelerated materials that uh, we cannot even control, and um, it's so unfortunate that uh, we have lost the the the. the, the the, the, the respect for God. We in this generation we have lost. We got no fear of God in us. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, if I'm going to talk about the religious dimension of rape and gender violence, I want you to also know that God is against gender violence. God is against rape. I want to give few examples of what uh, I can call, you know the examples of rape, and at the same time, the consequence. The first rape incident we saw in the scriptures was in the case of Lot and her daughters. Her daughters uh, decided to to produce children to their father, and they they, 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 they had him drunk. I mean, he was, he was drunk, and the first one slept with, 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 with her father, and the second daughter slept with her father the following day. And they, they produced uh, Ammon and Moab. That is the generation of Ammon and Moab. But the Bible makes it clear, the consequence is this, that they are among their cost nations. And the Bible made it clear to the people of Israel that they should have nothing to do, nothing to do with, with such a cost nation like Moab and Ammon. 
And what about the case? What about the case of a uh, shekel that uh, our respected uh, anguish of discourse in the, in the, in the case of a uh, shekel who raped Dina by force? I mean, the consequence was grievous. The entire men were, were killed and the, 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 the city plundered to, to nothing. And then what about the case, what about the, you know, the men in Gibeah that gang raped a Levite concubine? The Levite, the Levite decided to cut the body of that lady and send it to every tribe, every member tribe of Israel. And the Bible told us that they gathered together and, and the, 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 the tribe that was involved, which is, um, which is the tribe that was involved, was annihilated completely. What about Ammon, who also raped his half sister Tamar? Was a, it was a premeditated act involving both deception and force. But look at what happened. The Bible told us that you know uh, um, um, Absalom, who is the brother to Tamar, decided to murder this guy. He was killed. At every point of rape in the Bible, it ended terribly. And when you even talk about the laws of Moses, the issue is that if you rape a virgin, it is compulsory that you marry her. You pay all her, all her dowry and everything to marry her. If you rape a woman that is married, the consequence is death, complete death. I mean, you are, you are, you are killed. If you, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you rape a virgin, you, know, you marry. But in the case of Somebody who is betrothed to somebody, you um, you must die. That is some of the few things that I know about the biblical perspective of of, 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 of rape. And when it comes to my topic especially, I want you to know that we I want to divide us into two sections. I'm looking at my own world and the world that is coming behind. It is so interesting, ladies and gentlemen, that our world is completely different from theirs. The kind of things they do, the kind of things they believe is completely different from what we believe in. But if there is anything I have noticed about our, our nation as a country, we are too slow, just like um, Sheikh said, that we are always too slow to issues. Why? Why, for God's sake, that we don't see convictions all the time? We don't see convictions most of the time as the God's rape. It is unfortunate. It is unfortunate. Why? Why? To myself. You know, it is unfortunate that we 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 we, we find out that most most of the time we 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 okay. most I'm sorry most of the time the 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 the, the nation is so slow we are just too slow. For take for example the, the uh, in recent times in the last five, in the past five months we have seven hundred and seventeen. 717 rape cases. I've not had of any conviction at all. If we, we are slow to it, we don't enforce. If you are talking about America today, if you play with any child in the US, they live together 20 years. But in Nigeria, we run the case to the Supreme Court. I believe it is time for us to enforce this matter. I also believe that it is time for us to realize that, that, that home training is especially important in this matter. Ladies and gentlemen, I want us to do something. We should be willing to gang, we should gang up against rape. In our homes, we should gang up against rape. Our fathers and mothers should be responsible. We are raising too many irresponsible men. They don't have, they don't, they don't, they don't have um, um, self-value, and as a result of that, they do things anyhow. They, do, they lack process. As a result, they do things anyhow. I think it is time for us to also make sure And a psychiatric checkup. Some of these guys are sick, and I believe that it is time for us to look at it from that angle. Go for psychiatric checkup. And finally, I want us to have a situation whereby we, we are a brother's keeper. When you see a young girl going somewhere, watch out for the girl. When you see a young boy, that is the way we grew up in the African setting. Of Every Immediately, I mean, one of the things my wife used to do is that five minutes, five minutes is the 
is the is the electricity for any child around her. You you she must know what a child is doing in five minutes. And thank God we have produced great children. I believe it is time for the entire community to come together and gang up against rape in the churches we should talk. Hello. Hello. Wa alaikum salam. I'll call you back. Told me that most of the messages that were written by Apostle Paul, and I think if we leave Nigeria and begin to see enforcement on a regular basis, I, I believe that like, everything about rape will come down. Nigerians are fearful. The moment you do it, you, you do it to the first person, the second person, the third person, I can assure you, I can assure you that everything, everything will begin to come down. But it seems everybody feels that the country we, is that we don't have laws. And unfortunately, if I will go to the police, they treat it like a domestic issue. And when they talk about it, just have uh, set to lead, set to lead, it will be over. But I think that enforcement should come up. I think families should also become, uh, we should become our brother's keeper. When the girl is going somewhere, you are looking out for the girl. And let's stop all this idea of going, uh, sending children to holidays because most people who rape those children are their uncles and their brothers and their sisters. But uh, overall, I will build this issue to the family. And I enjoyed what the minister said to the family. If you and I will raise godly children, if you and I will raise the, uh, responsible children, I mean, I, I, I believe that this thing will put, will God will put a stop to it. Finally, like I, I, I we're talking about the home training. When we were very young, when we were very young, when they're showing um, something on the television that is sex or something, they put NTA Channel 10 on it, cover it until it is over, then we'll come back. Now, I, I, when we were young, our daughters, our daughters were trained how to sit down. I mean, when you sit, they'll tell you how to sit down, to stand up. And the same thing goes to the men. The, the, the young ones are trained self-control. We, 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 we make sure that we, we, we teach them the right way to live, etiquette and everything. If these things come from home, I can assure you Nigeria will be a better place. Like I used to say, the next president of Nigeria is in a house right now, or maybe in the next few years. He's in a house right now, taking feeding bottle. It is what to teach this boy or teach this girl that will determine what Nigeria will be. If we can, if we can go back to the home and work on it and, and become strict and disciplined in everything that we're doing, Nigeria will be a better place. Our women should not be devalued. For no reason should we devalue our women. We should give them honor and respect. Even when we join them together in churches as pastors or as, as, as imams, we should give them honor and respect. I always say it when I join them, I say, don't beat this woman. If you beat this woman, you are in trouble with me. And let me tell you the truth. I wouldn't mind, even if he's a member of my church, I would send him to jail. I can tell you, I'm, I, I, I love women, I respect them, I honor them, and I believe that if we start doing this, giving them great value, great things will begin to happen in that nation. And I want to say thank you very much for the privilege and the opportunity. Thank you very much, Pastor. I don't think there's anything in the presentation that anyone could possibly disagree with. Thank you very much for your submission. Uh, next, we have uh, Sheikh Mufti Ismail Menk on the panel. Assalamu alaikum, Ya Sheikh. Thank you very much for joining us, Ya Sheikh. Barakallahu fi. Jazakumullah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. I've been listening very carefully to speaker after speaker. And alhamdulillah, there is a lot that we have to be thankful for. I think it's the first time that we actually have males addressing a topic that they are mostly the perpetrators of and the victims happen to be that of the opposite sex although rape and gender-based violence is not necessarily about or is not about one specific gender but because the females are more affected by it i think uh, i feel so proud to be a part of this beautiful uh webinar today 
knowing that and perhaps just clarifying it for some of the international viewers, this was arranged by a Nigerian foundation based on challenges primarily that they're facing within Nigeria and in order to raise the awareness, but the message is absolutely international. So uh, with that in mind, you know, speaking of the challenges faced by the girl child as she uh, is born, in fact, we heard from Malam Abu Bakr right at the beginning how people consider a female child still within some circles as uh, you know, something to be ashamed of and so on. The Quran addresses that and says, you, you are not allowed to be. In fact, it is a, a sign of uh, disconnection from Allah. If you were to think for a moment that because I have a girl child, I am not blessed. Blessing. The of the Prophet, peace be upon him, speaks about how when a person has been blessed with the female child, he or she uh, would actually be earning paradise if they were to look after the child, give them the correct upbringing, and then get them married off and help them through their life, you know, through that stage of their life, they would be achieving paradise as a result. And he speaks about Two, two girls, you know, two girls, and in a narration, three girls. In order to make it clear to us that the importance given to the girl child is great. You know, it is such a big responsibility, and I feel when whenever there is a narration that states you get paradise for doing something, it is because of the greatness of the responsibility and how, how serious the matter is. So it's not just, oh, I've had three girls, so I'm going to get paradise. Did you communicate with them? Was the communication open? Could they confide in you? Could they talk to you? Did, did you talk to them about what to expect in life? Did you have the beautiful relationship? Did you offer them the respect that they deserve? Earlier, we were talking about, uh, you know, getting children married at an early age. And I believe, yes, that when we have the correct concern for our children, we will not get them married at such an age where they are not prepared for the marriage. It's not all about physical puberty or, you know, whether we are sexually active or inactive, etc. It's more to do with the holistic, uh, the holistic uh, aspects of the, the growth of that particular child are they. So, you know, mentally prepared, emotionally prepared, physical preparation is one thing, you know, the social challenges, various other challenges. So while addressing that issue, I do know that in parts of Nigeria, for example, because we're addressing the matter, there are some parts where they are so reluctant to discuss the matter of uh, setting a, a minimum age simply because they say, well, Islam didn't address it. The reality is, yes, the ulama are are uh, agreeing that Islam did not fix an age, but whether or not authority on land can look at the circumstances and fix an age, there are two opinions. And the stronger opinion is that definitely the authority on land has the right, especially when fathers are abused. And we need for that. I don't think that uh, we would deny that there are many fathers out there, so many who are abusing it. And the child is not ready, but because of economic reasons, because of other reasons, they, they begin to think that they have the power to sell the child off. And it's a reality, let's face it. So we as scholars addressing this matter from the pulpit is absolutely important. I wanted to also suggest, and I'm going to, I've made a lot of notes while I was listening to the speakers. And this is the reason why I might not go in the order that I had intended, but I don't want to miss any points. We must make sure that within the mosques and the churches and whatever else we have, uh, you know, the, the authority upon, we address this matter on a regular basis. They, it is said and known that most of the perpetrators are males. If that's the case for us as males to be talking about it is definitely something that will have a greater impact than when females were to talk about it. Although it's important for us to listen to what they have to say because they are part of our society. 
for decades they've been talking it's been just falling on deaf ears now we're talking let this not be the only webinar of its kind we must address this matter i think at least once a month uh, or maybe once every two months but it must be addressed because the more we talk about it the more people will become conscientized the victims will be empowered to be able to come out with what has happened to them because many times like sheikh nuruddin said perhaps 90 to 95% of the people who are victims have never reported it because there is something wrong with the structure they either feel like i'm going to report this and i will become a victim when i meaning i will become looked at as a perpetrator when i'm the victim so this is something that's been happening a lot uh, people come sometimes and they say you know this person's been raped but they don't want to talk about it because the father won't support it someone else won't support it uh, perhaps it will it will uh, turn back on them and so on which is ridiculous we should have society such that when a victim uh, has to come up with what has happened to the victim the entire society would actually support and take serious that allegation and i do know that yes you will have a small percentage of people who actually perhaps falsely allege things but we as religious personnel and even generally as the general public we're taught that no matter what an allegation is take it seriously take it seriously meaning do you offer protection to your child or to the member of community or to the member of your church or to the member of or, or to to a person within the public who comes up with an allegation do you offer them enough protection that they feel safe to say what happened to them without fearing that my you know the perpetrators or anyone else is going to actually uh, turn this against me such that i will look like the fool if we have that power and we've empowered them with it and provided them with that security we are heading towards at least eradicating or solving or minimizing the problem that we have we we have another very very big issue and that is when the perpetrator is a father which is happening a lot when the perpetrator is a brother an uncle a nephew or even a sibling it is happening a lot so it is very difficult to actually uh you know come up as a victim to say my father has sexually abused me or my brother or my uncle or a nephew or an anyone for that matter who is within the family we need to make sure we have such a good relationship with the girl child that uh, our own children feel very safe to come up to us and to tell us that you know what there is this problem i am facing uh, and and we should take it seriously like i said take it very serious if we don't take it seriously we are brushing it under the carpet and we're empowering the perpetrator so i think a lot of us are guilty of indirectly empowering perpetrators and making people feel like they can get away with it simply because no one is going to believe this victim you know it's her word against mine and who am i i'm the father i'm the uncle i'm the this sometimes even you know people who are uh, perhaps assisting a family financially or they happen to be charitable towards a certain family happen to abuse the widows sometimes they abuse the little girls that are there sometimes they even abuse the same sex so when we speak about rape it's not only between different sexes at times it is the same sex that people are abusing and can that person speak i have had many people who confide in me and tell me you know that man is very charitable but he does it for sexual favors if that is the case i mean that was not charity that is something you are using your money your authority your power to abuse someone sexually you deserve to be shamed and to be dealt with so it is happening and this is why we say when allah has blessed you with wealth never ever use that wealth in order to think that you can get away with murder or you can do something and and get away with it because allah is watching you're going to pay and another thing is society is going to struggle as a result of you having created a trend of people whom whenever you want to help someone you ask them for a sexual favor in return this happens in colleges at schools it happens in so many in universities there are so many people who are quietly because they want the grades they happen to give in because on one hand there is the pressure of your family your father and everyone else and on the other hand you know there is a, a lecturer or anyone a teacher threatening you to say uh, you know what i can give you grades if 
If what? You need to know, and I always tell my kids, if you haven't passed, it's okay. For as long as you tried your best, you enjoyed your time at school, we are here with you. And I am a father of eight daughters, and I am really concerned. I always tell them from a young age, and you know, it's, it's irrelevant who exactly should address this matter, but someone needs to. As husband and wife, or as father and mother, you need to arrive at a conclusion between yourselves that, look, uh, uh, you address this and I will address that. When you tell, I've told some of my little kids, no one's allowed to touch you. If anyone does touch you in your private parts or in a way that you're not comfortable, immediately tell dad, tell mom, we are here to protect you. We are here to serve you. We believe you. We are here to stand up for you. We will fight right to the end for you, my child. And this is when the child feels empowered. When, when rape has increased in society, it has many reasons. One of them is that the vulnerable have increased and we are not protecting them. We, we, we are not coming out to defend them. We make them feel that there is no safe place for you to actually communicate what's happening to you. And so because there's no support structure, we find that it, it actually increases. And secondly, there is no point in blaming a person who might not be dressed appropriately to say, you know what, you caused it. I want to explain why. There is definitely in religious teaching that we should be dressed in a moral, in a, in a morally upright way. That's in Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and for both male and female. But if someone is raped, how come? There are people who are covered head to toe in so many countries who are raped day and night. So where does that fit? Number one. Number two is... Allah tells the men first, like Sheikh, uh, the Honorable Minister said earlier, and it was a verse that was absolutely in its place. Allah tells the men first, lower your gaze. That verse comes before he even addresses the women. So if she has, for example, dressed in a way that you feel might not be Islamic or might not be moral, that does not ever, ever justify a sin against her or a crime against her. Because you're supposed to have lowered your gaze in the first place. If you were a person who followed that instruction, you would have lowered your gaze. You wouldn't even have noticed. When I was speaking to a group of youngsters and they were telling me, you know, I told them, when you see a female, what's the first thing that crosses your mind? What do you see? And the idea is to find out how in society we look at the opposite sex. So I was speaking to a group of youngsters. I want them to tell me, you know, or I want to teach them and train them that I see a mother. I see someone's sister, I see, you know, uh, someone's daughter, and I, I feel so blessed that we have such good people, and I look at someone, their ability, their, their capacity, their intellect, how much they are contributing to society, to their families. You know what? These young boys, 80% of them said, the first thing we, we, we look at is the breast and the behind, its size and what it looks like. And I'm going to say this loud and clear because as much as we, we have a problem, but this problem is needs to be addressed from all angles. These young boys need to be addressed and told, listen, and this is what I've done in, in my own little circles, but we need to address it more. No matter how much we address it, it's not going to be enough. It's an ongoing thing. I tell these young boys, look, you cannot say that you're supposed to be lowering your gaze anyway. So Allah tells you for, the, for your sanity, for everything, you know, lower your gaze. Then they come up and they say, well, you know what? There's porn on everybody's phone and pornography is everywhere. And we don't have a place to actually vent those urges that we have. So that is a crisis, but it does not justify you going out and uh, abusing or harming or committing a crime against someone else. So while we are telling on one hand people to say, be careful, your sister, your daughter, your mother, those in your family, make sure that you have actually offered them beautiful communication and they're reassured about the protection that's around them so that they can come up because people search for the most vulnerable of victims and they, they, they jump and pounce onto their prey when they know that there's no solid, powerful person who's going to protect this child. So they pounce on that. That having been said, while we're telling the people to keep that issue of protection and communication on the highest possible level, we need to also deal with perverted young men and women and even some of the older people. And I must admit that we are, in, we are living in an age of pornography that is being, you know, 
distributed in a way that is so embarrassing and it is so difficult to combat that because it's getting more and more and it's shocking how religious personnel have pawned on their phone uh, powerful political people have pawned on their phone people within the justice system have pawned on their phones uh, respectable parents have pawned on their phones and little children in their own system sometimes are well aware of what mom and dad are watching or passing or sending across here and there do i not have a right to encourage the people to say please let's be more responsible in the way we manage our ourselves before anyone else i need to address myself if i have anything immoral that i say or do or watch it's it's between me and allah i agree one might argue but it has a damaging effect and an impact it has a damaging effect and an impact when my imagine my children go through my phone at some point imagine if they were to see a, an immoral video on my phone and uh, exposed to it at an early age it is damaging to the mind these young boys that grow up they grow up in a way that everything is about sex to them and they don't have a place to vent it and to actually you know follow it through so what do they do they look for the most vulnerable of 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 victims if they don't find one of the opposite sex they will nail one of the same sex and who is to blame wallahi entire society including myself and yourselves are to blame when when a single one from amongst us is affected or is a victim of this type of crime so these are the difficulties and challenges some of them you know we have young girls who will say well you know uh, i really can't say anything because we depend on this person or nobody is going to believe me i have already tackled that you see the issue of amana a child is an amana the, the girls and boys of community are an amana when are we going to be looking at them as an amana amana meaning it's a trust entrusted to us by the almighty we definitely must be from among those who who understand when you see a person of the opposite sex look at them with respect with dignity you know lower your gaze if if you feel that oh you know the way they're dressed or uh, something you know it, it's going to lure or attract or it's going to make me think negative look immediately down the hadith the prophet sallallahu has addressed the men allah has addressed the men first and in fact to be very fair to the sisters yes as much as we will always keep promoting moral dress we will do it for both male as well as females there are so many females who say well you know what i'm so sexually attracted to this type of a man who is showing me half of this and half of that and what do you do as religious figures but well, i tell you we start off the way allah started kull al mu'minina yaghuddu min absarihim wa yahfadhu furujahum tell the believing males lower their gazes protect their own dignity protect their private parts you protect your private parts what does that mean make sure that you don't abuse the opposite sex even cutting comments those comments that actually have innuendos within them they are unacceptable from an islamic perspective you cannot address a female with cheap words simply because she's a female you cannot refer to her by the size of her organs you cannot do that from an islamic perspective it is considered prohibited it is something unacceptable and we are talking about it today so no one should say well you guys are not talking about it here we are it is not only unacceptable islamically it is a major sin imagine a, a woman uh, who perhaps sometimes and like allah says you know you will notice a few things uh, because madhahab minha sometimes she may be she might be dressed very appropriately but still because of her size because of whatever else people start commenting based on that you know making it a, a, a big thing so you find those who who might not and i'm going to say this openly because people accuse us of not addressing this and here we are addressing it. say for example you have in this hyper sexualized age people who start referring to the opposite sex based on their body parts and so on when they start creating a norm that destroys society because it's not normal it's a norm that's not a normal it's not something normal that should be there so those who are not of that standard feel very very low and those who perhaps are of that standard feel extremely embarrassed because they are being judged due to their gender due to their sex their sexuality or due to for example uh, how feminine they might look that is absurd that is something absolutely unacceptable so but we need to address our minds we need to actually revisit this needs to be discussed on all levels like i said i will make it my duty i have discussed it in masjids before
but the men need to talk to other men about it. And that's why I congratulate the organizers of this webinar because women have been addressing this for years on end. No one's listening. Today we are here. We want to address it. We should address it. And we will use the pulpit in order to continue talking about how we should be looking at women. A man comes to the Prophet and says, I want to commit this sexual act with so and so. You know, so he, he, he didn't just he, he immediately engaged the mind of the of the youngster. And he says, would you like to do it with your mother? No. With your sister? No. With your daughter? No, etc. And he says, well, everyone that you're going to be looking at is either you're a mother or a sister or a daughter, etc. The same rule applies when it comes to sexual violence or gender based violence or abuse or rape where it is someone's mother, it is someone's sister. I think if we develop that in society to be able to tell people, look at them as people who are someone's mother, sister, daughter. Would you like it to happen to your own? No. Well, why Why then do you, agree, do you want it to happen to someone else? So this is a major issue in society. And this is why we say, going now to another, like I said, I'm going to jump a little bit, going to the issue of, uh, marriage sometimes, and it, it's happening a lot in in rural areas in some of our countries where we find that a very young age people are being forced to marry. In fact, not just rural, even in some cities, some of the girls are being forced to marry for whatever reason, a person whom they really don't like. You know, from an Islamic perspective, you're not allowed to do that. You know, we can tear to pieces an opinion of someone who might say that, you know what, uh, someone who might say that, uh, no, it's okay. It is not okay. You cannot let someone marry a person whom they don't want to marry. Not at all. So if, if subhanAllah, that is happening in society, imagine getting up every morning and you have a person whom you really dislike right next to you. We as men need to solve that problem. We need to resol resolve the matter. We have to come to the aid of those who are in that type of a situation. My beloved brothers and sisters, even the justice systems, the, the, the scholars, the, the religious leaders, we all have to team up if we'd like to solve this matter. It's not going to be, uh, you know, uh, solved if only one party talk about it. You, you know, so that's the issue of marriages which are that are forced. It's happening. Many people say, I didn't want to marry, but I had to marry because of this and this. You're, you're actually forced to sleep with someone you really don't like if that is not if that is not a crime, then what is it? Subhanallah. If we cannot help those victims, they are victims, then we are. what are we good for? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us ease. I do also acknowledge that, yes, indeed, we, as much as we have a problem of porn and we need to deal with that, on one hand, we also need to deal with intoxicants. And I think when we empower people uh, and we care for them holistically, we probably would be able to do much more. <clears throat> But it's going to be a tough task. We've taken it on our shoulders. We must. And we're going to have to deal with this, inshallah, as best as we can by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we also have the issue of how in Islam, the punishment is the most severe punishment when it comes to rape. It is extremely severe. Some might say, well, why hasn't Islam addressed it? I personally have not come across a rape in the, at the time of the Prophet Sallam, and I would like to think that the reason is that society was so powerful, the men were so powerfully protective over their women that no one would dare, would dare even pass a cutting comment. I remember, and there is an incident where there was a woman who they abused uh, in a way that they tied while she was sitting, they tied the bottom part to, of her dress to the top part of her dress in a way that when she got up, uh, she, her, her private parts were exposed in public. Do you know the Prophet, peace be upon him, prepared an army and went to war for that one woman who was just abused in a way that she was exposed and embarrassed in society in public. Now imagine what do we do? We are weak. My brothers and sisters, we have to become stronger. Another thing, don't ever, ever defend a perpetrator. Let him I do know, like I said, small percentage of people sometimes might come up, they see a wealthy person, they want some money. That's a very small percentage of people who see someone in power, they want to bring him down. They might come up with a false allegation. However, that is very small percentage, number one. Number two is even if they do come up with an allegation, what's my duty? I will take it seriously. I will take it seriously. 
and I will study it. I will give them protection. They need to be protected. The problem is our own families don't protect us. Our communities don't protect us. How are we going to solve this problem? So it's really difficult. I was saying in Islam, the punishment is so severe because it is a deterrent. Deterrent meaning as soon as someone hears about what's happening to these rapists, what's happening to these who are engaging in crime, they will immediately think 20 times to say, I'm definitely not going to be a part of this and I don't want to actually uh, do this. So my brothers and sisters, yes, I do know perhaps I've taken up all of my time but don't worry, I think I deserve a little bit more time coming all the way from Zimbabwe and having actually sat here for a very long time, listening to all of it was very beneficial. Mashallah, tabarakallah. You know, the cultural norms sometimes in society and community that are not changed over time based on what's happening are posing a threat to the very security of our girls and the vulnerable. So sometimes, and culture is not a bad thing. Culture is usually, generally, a very good thing. People who are cultured, culture teaches you millions of, of beautiful teachings. But there are certain cultural norms that need to be rebuilt. We need a drive where we can visit the rural areas, the leaders, religious leaders, you know, the, the, the chiefs or those who are tribal leaders as well, and talk to them and address the matter to get them to talk about it because we've taken the initiative to address them, to explain to them why. Like, for example, the issue of marriage age. It, you know, yes, Islam and the religions don't really fix the age. They leave it to the discretion of the father. But when the father is abusing that discretion, then authority definitely has that um, a mandate to come in and to actually say, look, it's fixed at, for example, 16 or 18 I mean, different countries, different societies fix it at a different thing, and it changes with sometimes with the changing of time. And on top of that, I do know that in, in countries where it is fixed, they can make exceptions when there's an application made. So say, for example, you know, you're one year or two years under, and there is a specific reason why this thing needs to happen, etc. There must be a way out to, to, to be heard that, look, we'd like to get married. It's a little bit too soon, according to the law, uh, according to what's stipulated. And perhaps we want to uh, we want to be heard to see if it's going to be OK in our case. So it, the norm should be that there is a fixed age. And then if there is anything that is out of that, it should only be done by permission and by others looking at whether, you know, by the justice system or authority looking at whether by merit, it is okay in this particular uh, instance. So that is something that uh, is also extremely important. Uh, there are so many other issues that I could actually raise that face the girl child. Many of you have already raised them. May Allah make it easy. I'm just so happy to be able to have come out and openly spoken about some of these challenges. My brothers, my sisters, uh, all the, the, the panelists, uh, you know, uh, beautiful, powerful people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a means of um, uh, our success. And at the same time, I pray that, uh, you know, every time I address a matter that is very, very important and people are not addressing it, I, I feel like, my, you know, my shoulders that are very, you know, sometimes burdened with a lot, I feel slightly relieved. But this one here, as much as there is a slight relief, I think there is going to be a very, very big responsibility. I've taken it upon myself and I want all of you to take it upon yourselves, the men, the men, more than the women, to talk about this and to keep on addressing the matter and to tell society how we should be looking at women as respectable, honorable members of society and community, family members who have similar offerings to offer society and community. You know, look at their service, look at their dedication. We should never look at them as sex objects. And I want to end off by repeating, never ever uh, try to justify a sin be based on what you think someone else is or is not doing, more so when it comes to the issue of dress. What really irritates me as a religious leader is when someone says so-and-so was raped. Unfortunately, the worst thing that can be said is how was she dressed? That to me is a sign of the biggest jahiliya and the biggest ignorance because irrespective of whether she was nude or not, your crime is something that is absolutely worse than what she may have 
totally separately done between her and Allah. It's no justification whatsoever. And if only we came up with that today, I swear this webinar would be successful. May Allah grant us all ease. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you for everyone being patient with me. I know I've overshot a little bit, and I hope you can excuse me for that. Thank you very much, Shashi. Just a, a little more than a little bit, but alhamdulillah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, all right. Um, I just added to, is there anything that you would like to add? Um, I thought um, you, you, you had to take him on, on some, something. You should go ahead with yours when I do mine. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I just like to remind the audience that you can tune in on Silver Bay TV, channel 252, and on DSTV. And you can find us also on Facebook as M A R S V Mars V. Mm. Yes, that's my part. All right. I. Okay. Is that what you were? Okay. Yes, that's all. Um, there is a very private question that came in, uh, which um, the uh, the person wanted uh, Brother Mufti Man to answer. Is um, looking at the issue of ijbar and looking at the issues of the choice of a husband, which is a right that's consent in, in, in marriages. She asked, how does the choice of her husband promote peace that reduces the risks of violence and abuse from her husband? Uh, she raises the issue of the woman who went to the Prophet wasallam, and after the ruling agreed to marry the man. But in reality, this woman is saying, I have tried that but it didn't work. I am under abuse. I'm now frigid and I need help. So I know we will support her. Rapa will support her, but is there anything that uh, uh, Sheikh Menk would want to add to that, please? Bismillah rahman rahim I think what's important for us to know, number one, is we should all make dua for the sister to begin with. And I'm a person Ooh. who dua alone will not solve your problem when Allah has given you the capacity to do way beyond that. But Dua helps because it, it, it gives you that sense of belonging to the whole group with the, with the person who is the victim being a part of the same group. So that's number one. Number two is if something has happened, you have gotten married, there, there will always be an element of the unknown when you're getting married. There's never a time when you're absolutely 100% certain that this marriage is going to work. Even though you, out of excitement, sometimes you might think that that's the case, but you know there is uncertainty. Once you get into it, if you find abuse and if you find that your rights are not being fulfilled, like Sheikh Nuru said earlier, Sheikh Nuru Din, that you know there must be a mechanism in place for such people to actually go to, and it will, it should be a safe place where they can go and they can uh, get either the matter resolved or even come out of that marriage because that too is something that Islam has ordained. If a person does not want to be in a specific marriage, they cannot be forced to remain in it. And I think what's, what's, what's wrong is people take the opinions of scholars and they use the harshest opinions and they come and impose them on others. We need to have an international council International Council of Scholars where we can address these matters. I do know that there are some scholars bodies, but many of them are actually very politicized. They are connected to governments of countries and therefore they don't have that, uh, that clout that they are supposed to be having at times. However, I think every masjid, every church, every religious place should actually have a safe corner or a safe place where people can come and, you know, uh, uh, address the matter, raise it, and they will be helped in a very professional way. One thing I must admit about our Muslim brothers and sisters, I'm not too sure about people of other faiths, but we lack professionalism when it comes to dealing with these matters. We deal with it in such a way that the whole community starts gossiping about something just because one malam was confided in. And that imam or that sheikh has told the whole world, he told someone in his family and they and it spread. So they lose faith in us. We need the confidentiality and the professionalism when it comes to dealing with, with matters that are sensitive. So in this particular case, what I would advise the sister to do is to take it up.
because she has rights. Allah has given her the rights. If she's not happy in it, she should come up and she should address, uh, meaning she should uh, raise the issue and inshallah she will be helped. In my society and community, I try my best. And obviously we don't have, like in my country, we don't have the, the, the arm of the law to be able to actually um, uh, push forward what we as religious personnel have decided. But we do have the law which would actually uh, be, be, you know, uh, the, the governing authority would actually need to be uh, uh, perhaps visited and a, a complaint would need to be lodged there for them to execute something. But within our religious circles, we do have panels, we do have arbitrations and, and you know, to resolve matters and so on. May Allah make it easy uh, for her and for everyone in her position and even for those in worse positions than that. I, I have so many people who confide in me. They tell me things and then they say, uh, when I tell them, what would you like to do about it? I suggest A, B, C. And they say, no, I can't. I, I really can't. I just want you to pray for me because I, I fear this and I fear that. And in my heart, I think to myself, I wish I had that authority to be able to pick this man up and shake him up a little bit and tell him what <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Yashai. All right, we will move on to our final speaker. His Highness Sheikh Sanusi Amin of the Second. Salaamu Alaikum, Yashai. Hello? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammadin ibn Abdullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Let me begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate in this extremely interesting and enlightening webinar. I've had the opportunity to listen to great scholars and I'd like to thank them for this opportunity. Uh, Mufti Menk, uh, Sheikh Fantemi, Ustaz Abakar Sadiq, Imam Ali Agan, Reverend Job, Pastor Washika, Nur Lemu, Reverend Monokwa, and other panelists. Um, I would like to thank you for uh, giving this issue the attention it deserved and covering it from the various perspectives of the two, uh, of the two religions. Um, I've been asked to speak about the contemporary challenges facing Sharia legislation on rape and domestic violence. And just to give a little bit of context to, to this topic, um, we know, for example, that we have at least 12 states in northern Nigeria that um, going back to 1999, 2000, 2001, uh, declared that they were adopting Sharia law. Uh, one of the most interesting things about these states when you look at them is that between 2000 and today which is 20 years uh, with the exception of the criminal law none of these states has passed any sharia law family law has not been codified um, com um law of contract has not been codified and you end up with the impression that sharia law is limited to amputating the hand of a thief, um, stoning an adulterer, whipping someone who's drunk um, alcohol, um, and that is and that's it. So all the other things around the family, around relations, around marital relations, around the age of marriage, have been codified. Now, this was an issue for me, and I remember in 2014 when I became AB. One of the first things I did was to set up a committee of religious scholars to try to codify a Muslim law of personal status. And it took us three years. Now, the reason this is important is for you to actually legislate in Nigeria on Sharia. As Sheikh Nur said, you have to involve the scholars. Sometimes you have to debate with them. Sometimes you have to force them to research. You have to force them to think. Sometimes you have to force them to look at what other Muslim countries have done, Malaysia, Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt. And try to explain to them that we are not the only Muslims in this world. How come the scholars in those countries have accepted these changes? How come we're not accepting them? Now, part of what I'm going to talk about on rape is to say, um, going back to, to that experience, how you use the 
classical Islamic law as a foundation, because you can't get rid of that, and how on that foundation and based on that foundation, we can legislate for the contemporary world. What are the issues? Um, and also, um, from my experience in uh, the production of that Muslim family law, some of the things that perhaps we have been blind to, because sometimes the issue is not so much the people, it's not so much the scholars, it is actually something beyond that. So, um, I'm supposed to speak about um, the legislation for rape, and some of that has been discussed uh, by, by Sheikh Nur. I'll try not to repeat uh, what has been said, other than to endorse and to say that I support uh, certainly everything that's been said by all the scholars that have spoken before me. Now, now, now rape um, in classical Islamic jurisprudence has been looked at from two different perspectives. The vast majority of scholars have treated rape as an act of zina, which is adultery or um, uh, fornication, and also liwat, which is sodomy, accompanied by violence. Um, a minority have treated it as a case of heraba, which is uh, brigandage, um, similar to armed robbery, um, and I will come to that and the arguments that they have. Now, depending on where you classify rape, there are serious consequences and implications for things like the law of evidence and also the punishment. And the reason is that the Islamic law on adultery and fornication and the law of evidence is actually geared towards protecting the integrity of people and protecting them from being falsely accused and slandered. And that is the reason, because, and, and in fact, the context and search no was a slander on Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the, the law of evidence, when it comes to fornication and adultery, is designed to make sure that only when you have absolute proof, incontrovertible proof, do you accuse anyone of committing adultery or fornication. And that's why you need four eyewitnesses or a voluntary confession which can be retracted. In fact, some scholars say um, the, the confession must be given four times. And it's not just a confession to say, oh, I committed adultery. You must um, confirm that you actually penetrated. You must confirm that you knew it was illegal. You must confirm that you knew it was zina and all that, and that you were in your senses uh, before you are convicted. Now, the problem with taking rape and treating it as zina with violence is that inadvertently the rapist enjoys the protection that is given to um, an average human being whose reputation is being protected. On the other hand, if you took rape as heraba, the law of evidence is different principally because that law is aimed at protecting the society from the aggression of criminals. And therefore, you do not protect the rapist, you protect the victim. Whereas if you took it as a case of Zina, you would be protecting the rapist without meaning to. Now, the vast majority of Muslim scholars in the past, uh, the Hanafi scholars and the Hanbali scholars and some Shafi scholars, um, treated rape as a case of Zina with violence. Um, in Maliki law, um, certainly, um, and I think um, Sheikh Nur referred to Ibn Arabi, there's also Imam al-Qurtabi, and if you look at the commentaries on the text, if you look at Ulaish, Aminah al-Jalid, if you look at um, Jasuki's, uh, Jasuki's Hashia and Sheikh al-Kabir, in Maliki law, there is a very strong position that rape is a case of Heraba. It is um, linked because at the end of the day, um, it, um, the, the underlying commonality is that somebody uses force or fear or intimidation to take away from people that which does not belong to him. It doesn't matter whether it is life um, or property or somebody's sexuality or somebody's dignity. So um, Hiraba as a crime um, is one that uh, um, also involves facade and the, uh, that's uh, causing corruption um, in the land. And therefore, uh, the Maliki position uh, fundamentally is that rape is seen as a case of heraba, as a case of transgression uh, or brigandage, rather than as a case of, um, uh, of sinner.
Now, what are the implications um, of that? Um, in Hiraba, you don't need four, four eyewitnesses. Uh, you need two witnesses. In Hiraba, one of the witnesses can be the victim. Therefore, if a woman is raped or a man is raped, their testimony is taken as that of a witness. If you do not have a witness to the act, you are allowed to have um, circumstantial evidence. This circumstantial evidence could be, for example, um, the, the girl screamed at somebody.